I wonder if just that way of being exposed, the repeated continual slight exposure to those allergens and potential bacteria and things like that actually contributed to a stronger immune system in the long run. Is that, is that the dirt theory in a nutshell? Yeah, basically. Okay. We're the, you know, Africa has no peanut allergies. Welcome to Cell Funded with Spencer, sponsored by Pareto Health, Claim Doc, and Plan Site. Whether we're discussing innovative new healthcare strategies, exposing hidden revenue streams or misaligned incentives, or even just cheering on the next generation of this industry, we promise you that you're going to learn something. So thank you for joining us for another great conversation about the future of healthcare. Marty, I, I really appreciate you coming down. I appreciate you stopping by. I know you had an event in Oklahoma <laughs> as well. Um, they got you near Dallas, but thank you for making this a part of your stop. And we'll talk about your book here in a second. Uh, but Marty, why don't you real quick for the folks that maybe aren't familiar with you, although I, I suspect a lot in our industry are, why don't you give us a little bit of your background before we dive into the book? Well, it's great to be with you, Spence, and uh, congrats on having this great vehicle to educate people about healthcare benefits and uh, this giant space that I like to call the big American ripoff, and that is <laughs> that most businesses are getting ripped off on their health benefits. So thanks for what you're doing. My pleasure. I'm a uh, surgical oncologist at Johns Hopkins. I'm trained in gastrointestinal and cancer surgery. Um, I am a public health researcher. That's always been the focus of my work. Um, I've um, got an appointment at the business school, and we do a lot on healthcare costs. Okay. And now we run something called an evidence-based medicine research and public policy group. So we try to look at the big topics in medicine that nobody's talking about okay. that we need to be talking about, and and these blind spots. And we also have a team that's designed to respond quickly to problems in healthcare. So when the opioid epidemic happened. We needed research right away. We needed to talk about it right away. We couldn't sit around and wait for our journals to publish things in their one-year cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We had to start writing op-eds and do things in the media. Yeah, and what is it? And I, I, you've uh, been fairly public. I, I started to be aware of you, I think, at the U Powered Symposium a number of years ago. You were the keynote speaker for that event that in, was fun. in Arizona, which was awesome. And then, yeah. of course, noticed you on TV. And I believe you were, were you part of uh, Trump's uh, administration in some capacity? As no, well? I wasn't. Oh, okay. I, 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 oh, I was I involved in the price transparency executive order. Ah. Okay. That he signed. So he that was he was supportive of that. He launched that. It was bipartisan. Biden increased the fines for noncompliance. So it was an incredibly bipartisan effort, and I was involved in Which that. Which is very rare <laughs> these yeah, days. Yeah, it's rare, yeah. yeah it's very rare, rare yeah. these days. What I was getting at, yeah. though, is the sort of the utilization of media, you know, whether mm -hmm. it be a book, whether it be speaking on a news show, whether it's public speaking. When did that sort of enter into your life, into your career? And, and maybe was there an intentionality behind that, or is that just something that happened naturally? No intentionality. So we've done a lot of research uh, at Johns Hopkins. I think I've published like almost 300 scientific studies. And with each study, the media starts taking an interest because our topics are related to <clears throat> pain points in society and public health and things that people uh, relate to or need to want to know about. So a lot of media interviews just opened up based on our research studies. And then they would just invite you back. Hey, can you explain this to us? Can you talk about this? And there's not really a specialty in medicine for healthcare. You know, like when you when you're in school, they tell you like, pick your organ. You know, like which, <laughs> you know, are you going to be a spleen guy or are you going to be a lung doctor or a heart doctor? And it's like, you know, I felt like, what if you're interested in the entire system? Right. How right. we deliver care, the cost of care, how we fund research, how we choose what to focus on, how we organize medicine, how we, you know, decide what services to deliver in the community versus in the hospital, health benefits. So I was always interested in the entire health system. And I don't know, if, you know, we don't know what to call this specialty, but right. we call it the redesign of healthcare. Well, I, I am all for the re redesign of healthcare. As somebody that's worked inside the healthcare system on the insurance and the risk and claim side for the last 15 or so years of my career, I'll be the first one to say that I'm all for <laughs> us finding a way to redesign it in a much better way than we're conducting it today. So what, what I want to touch on the book because I know it'll shape the conversation, but as my understanding, this is book number three for you, correct? So what were your first two, or you have two bestsellers, right? 
two uh, bestsellers, a uh, book called Mama Maggie. I co-authored an Good. autobiography about my aunt. So this is... Um, so this Blind Spots, right? Healthcare book number three called Blind Spots. Um, just came out, uh, really excited about it. And so it's been a passion project and the results of our research now for a couple of years. So what's, a, what's the difference? And you, you've obviously cited a number of uh, studies that you've published, right? But what is the difference in conducting a study, getting it through peer review and having it published versus writing a book instead? Tell me about your process. Well, it's interesting. During the Obamacare debate, uh, when that was going on about 10 years ago, what we found is that the, de the debate was changing every day, and you had to be in print media. You had to be in the newspapers, writing articles. Now, is writing an article about, say, some new melanoma treatment f million, a million times less reliable because they did the research in 48 hours? No, they verify their sources. They have journalistic standards. And so um, our process just doesn't fit the needs of healthcare today. That's why healthcare podcasts are taking off mm -hmm. and healthcare books like Peter Atia's books and Z Dog and all these guys out there, Huberman. Um, people want that ability to analyze research immediately, mm -hmm. comment on it, and that's what the media does with high journalistic standards. So our peer review process is long, burdensome, political, and the people who are running the editorial boards at medical journals. Uh, that's kind of a group of people who, let's just say most of them are in those jobs for life. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. it's, they're kind of like monarchs in the field. <laughs> and if they like an idea, if they think the microbiome is interesting, the published stuff, but otherwise, you know, they're sticking to the old fashioned heart disease, kidney disease, lung disease. So um, writing a book, in my opinion, is something you should only do if you feel like there is something that desperately needs to be discussed that is not currently being discussed. So what was that for blind spots then? What was the thing that wasn't being discussed that desperately needed to be discussed? The microbiome, the way children are delivered, the way we prevent cancer. There's all kinds of amazing new research now that has really not made it to the public. Okay. And it's just because the, the amazing pioneers who have who have done this research don't have the, the vehicle to get it out there. Okay. And in science, we're supposed to ask questions. So I wanted to pose a big one. Could it be that many of our modern day health crises mm -hmm. were caused by or hastened by the hubris of the medical establishment? Okay. The peanut allergy epidemic, the denying women hormone replacement therapy and all the health benefits, the low fat diet dogma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Medical dogma has loomed large in medicine. And unfortunately, when we present it as scientific evidence, when it's really just the opinion of the group think, we can do tremendous damage. When we in medicine use good science, we do a lot of good. Pareto Health is the largest benefits captive in the United States. With nearly 3,000 captive members, 1.3 billion of stop loss premium in force and almost 1 million covered lives, no other benefits captive comes close to Pareto Health scale. But it's not just about the numbers. Pareto Health is a mission-driven organization, and that mission has two distinct parts. Number one, to make self-insurance simple and more accessible for small to mid-sized employers. And number two, to arm them with the most powerful cost management tools on the market. So if you're an employer frustrated with your healthcare outcomes, or you're a benefits consultant looking for an alternative to the status quo, it's time to consider Pareto Health. Pareto Health, where employers come to do self-insurance right, to do it easily, and to do it at scale. Well, that's just it. It's, it's, it is, the, I want to say, good versus bad science. And you, you, I think you use the terminology dogma a couple of times, and it really is dogma. But how do we get to a point where dogma overrides rationality and uh, curiosity, if you will? Why, and why is medi medicine, at least in the United States, so prone to dogma? Well, I think we've got more centralized decision making now than we've ever had. We've got a group of people at the top who are running what we call organized medicine. Okay. The Board of Medicine, the Specialty Associations, the American Medical Association. So you take, for example, the story of the peanut epidemic, yeah. peanut allergy epidemic. A small group of people, a very tiny group of people at the American Academy of Pediatrics decided, based on their opinion, 
that moms should avoid peanuts if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, and all children should avoid peanuts age zero through three if they were considered at risk, and it was very nebulous. And what, what, yeah, was, what was the evidence even suggest that they should avoid it? What, what did it start from? You a think? gut feeling. A gut feeling, okay. So, um, <laughs> so people listened. Yeah. This is an established body. Now they have big platforms to broadcast their public health recommendations. Mm -hmm. So for about 15 years, this was the sort of law of the land that parents should avoid. Like, I know you've got kids. I don't mm -hmm. know if, if that was... You know, up till 19, 2000. Well, the only thing that I recall us being concerned about was giving uh, like peanut butter too early because of the concerns of a difficulty swallowing, I think was the recommendation. Um, but th we never had any issues with peanut allergies, but it is something that's in my lifetime I become aware of. I do remember before there ever was a concern of peanut allergies. Now it seems like everywhere you go, you're not allowed to have peanuts or open peanuts in a school classroom or on an airplane. And it's just like, how did we go from that to, to that extreme? So what, what was driving that? And you know, ultimately, was that dogma bad science, in your opinion, as well? It was terrible science. Okay. And they got it wrong because it was a small group of people that was that were disconnected from the immunology bench science community that had long known about what we also call the dirt theory. And that is when you're exposed to something mm -hmm. as an infant, your immune system is tolerant to it. And when you're not, when you have total avoidance, your immune system is sensitized to it. Mm -hmm. And so when the recommendation got issued in the year 2000 for all okay. young kids to avoid peanuts, peanut allergies skyrocketed. Right. Right. And we've got an epidemic today, severe allergies. I mean, people can't be in the same room as yeah. a peanut yeah. sometimes. It's life-threatening. It's real stuff. And this is, by and large, a man-made, manufactured crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, it existed before 2000, but the rise was because of this peanut avoidance. They thought avoiding peanuts would prevent peanut allergies in children. They got it backwards. Yeah. It it drives peanut allergies. And that study was done eventually about seven years ago, published in the book. Well, it's journal. funny you say the dirt theory. I haven't heard the dirt theory, but I can remember growing up chicken pox parties where you wanted your kid to go get chicken pox. I can remember drinking out of water hoses on the outside of the house. You know, I don't remember ever washing my hands to the extent that you're encouraged to wash your hands these days. And I wonder if I have really strong immune system, you know, comparatively to what I know a lot of people have, is my wife being one of them, I wonder if just that way of being exposed, the repeated continual slight exposure to those allergens and potential bacteria and things like that actually contributed to a stronger immune system in the long run. Is that, is that the dirt theory in a nutshell? Yeah, basically. Okay. We're the, you know, Africa has no peanut allergies. We've got <laughs> students from Africa and they're coming over to the U.S. and they're like, Marty, what's going on here? It's yeah. everywhere. Like, yeah. it contains nuts. You know, yeah. first question they ask you at a waiter table. Yeah. And so um, they have peanuts that are part of, they're boiled and they're part of foods and soups and cooking oils. Mm. And so they're exposed to it there. And so well, this is almost a uniquely American problem and UK problem. They, they you know, jumped on this bandwagon just before we did. But it just shows, like, if we rely on groupthink, mm -hmm. we don't have a very good track record in medicine. We create problems. Mm -hmm. And when we use good, a good scientific method, the concern today is, okay, we got the peanut thing wrong for 15 plus years. The problem today is that you're not allowed to question certain things right, in right. certain circles. And that's a dangerous pattern. We've, we've got to preserve that ability. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's group think, think, but it's entrenched, protected group think, where there's almost a, a, like a defensive mode around it where, like you said, you're not even allowed to question it at all, yeah. which is a really bizarre thing to me when it seems like scientific pursuit is the pursuit of knowledge, which means a constant, continual questioning of consensus and things like that. And we saw it during COVID. Yeah. Oh how how dare yeah. you question a booster for a yeah. healthy 17-year-old that just recovered from from COVID. Yeah. You know, this is, it comes from on high. So why do you think it was taken to such an extreme during the last couple of years? I mean, because I, <laughs> I can't ever, I mean, I was always sort of skeptical of certain establishments, but now it was just like the veil was lifted and it just seems like it was a cohorted and concerted effort for, to scare a lot of people. Why though? Why, why did they use this, this event in your opinion to really, um, let's say ratchet up some of the hysteria? 
I don't, I don't know. I, I didn't, I didn't uh, write about COVID in the book yeah. Blind Spots. I just felt like people have already made up their mind or they're yeah. tired of it. Or, but it, it, COVID was not a one-off. We got this one thing wrong, and yeah. otherwise, all the other public health recommendations were solid. Mm. No. It's, it was actually emblematic mm. of many public health recommendations based on groupthink and hubris. The low-fat diet, we got that wrong yeah. for 60 years. Opioids, we got that wrong for 30 years telling people it's not addictive. We, you know, we have either hastened or contributed significantly to many of the modern-day health crises when we go off the, the, the rails and we just wing it. When we use the good scientific process, we do much better. Well, an example, another one in the book that you said was the uh, hormone replacement therapy <laughs> issue for females. So explain that one for me before we dive in. This is probably one of the biggest screw-ups in all of modern medicine. Okay. So um, for nearly half a century, women were enjoying the benefits of hormone replacement therapy estrogen or estrogen plus progesterone, mm -hmm. if uh, they, s they still have your uterus intact, you need to add the progesterone to it. So either E or E plus P. Women were living longer, mm -hmm. years longer. Uh, they were, the symptoms of menopause were being alleviated. Mm -hmm. They were, if they fell or were in a car accident, they were much less likely to break a bone. The risk of heart attacks went down almost in half. Mm -hmm. The um, Cognitive decline and brain fog of menopause was reduced, and there was a 35% lower rate of Alzheimer's. Okay. There were all these tremendous benefits. Okay. And that's just a small fraction of the benefits I laid out in the book. But I'm waiting for the yeah, but. So and what's then the about yeah, 20 yeah. years ago, a researcher at the NIH announced in a press conference that he had just completed the largest study ever done financially okay. in taxpayer history, a billion dollar study conducted by the NIH and announced that hormone therapy causes breast cancer. Okay. Now, it, he didn't release the data. About a week later, it gets published in a journal. I find out that all the co-authors, they were basically ambushed at a meeting saying, hey, we found this result, we're publishing it. You know, you can't really make changes to the uh, article. It's already been accepted. If you look at the actual data in that study, mm -hmm. it does not show any statistically significant difference in breast cancer rates among women who took hormone therapy versus placebo. Yet 80 to 90 percent of people, including doctors, 80 to 90 percent of doctors still today believe that press conference announcement, even though the data never supported it. So I found the, the researcher okay. and I went to him in doing the research for blind spots and I told him, how could you make this recommendation? And he basically acknowledged um, that it, did, it was not statistically significant, but it was close. Mm. It approached statistical. It was nominally, you know, yeah. approach. I'm like, you know, that's not a thing. Like, if that's a thing, like, we don't have science. Like, yeah. snake oil cures cancer and vaccines cause autism. And, like, you have to use statistical standards. Right. So but then why do you believe there. he was so convinced? And why did he make this proclamation so publicly and we end up where we are all this time later. What do you well, believe the reason was? I don't know. I went back and it turns out that he had made statements publicly and had written that we have to stop the hormone replacement therapy bandwagon. Okay. He was on a mission. Hmm. And when the data didn't support what he wanted to see in the data, he just said it anyway. Because when I spoke to him, it was clear he believed it in his heart to be true. Hmm. And so uh, it caused tremendous damage. I mean... 50 million American women probably have been denied hormone therapy because of his announcement. Yeah. Maybe 200 million worldwide. One of the, the greatest health benefit interventions in all of medicine for women uh, denied to, now not 100% of women are candidates, but the vast majority of women. Right. And they, to this day, they should ask their doctor about this and re read about it. That's fascinating to me. And I think you're, you're talking about maybe digging into the psychology a little bit of human beings uh, as you were investigating for this book. And I'm curious, 
of the psychology of this, right? It maybe was it the, the size and the scope of the study and all the dollars that were behind it that he felt compelled he had to get to this outcome and stick behind it? Or what do you think is just maybe uh, an individual convinces himself and wants something to be true so badly that they might deny or ignore evidence to the contrary just so they don't feel embarrassed or don't feel like they've lost all this time and effort in their career? Like, tell me about the psychological <laughs> component of that. Well, I, I'm amazed at how people are absolutely sure and they will defend passionately their position just because they heard it first mm. and it's not that there's the logic or reasoning we hold on to ideas and we defend them joel um, leon festinger was a psychologist he's now passed away but he had probably studied this topic more than anyone else why do um why do we hold on to things mm -hmm. why do we uh, why are we not open-minded when somebody right. comes in with new information? And what he, des what he described was a, a principle now known as cognitive dissonance, yeah. which, which dissonance means discomfort. He said, the brain doesn't like having two conflicting ideas inside of it. It basically only wants one idea. We want to kind of take the lazy route. The brain <laughs> just wants to believe one thing. So when you have an idea and now there's a new idea that upsets it, you want to reframe the new idea to make it work so it's not really what it mm -hmm. says it is. You want to say, well, it's really the same thing as what I already believe. You work, the brain will work wonders to try to dismiss new information. Mm. And you see this in discussions about politics and news. And people are set in their ways. Good people right. get so set in their ways. And um, Dr. Bernard, who's considered the father of modern medicine, mm -hmm. Uh, he was in the 1800s in France. He said that really a scientist has to suspend all their biases to consider new information. Mm -hmm. And I thought there's nothing more timely than his recommendation for today. It requires an active process. You have to realize, okay, I have biases. You know, we, um, during COVID, we had to evaluate new studies like this. Okay, we have biases. You know, I was upset that the public health establishment had not warned the country. I was out there warning the country that COVID was coming and it was gonna be bad. And I, I had these biases and you have to suspend all your biases and consider maybe the new information doesn't fit the, the, the conventional thinking or what I wanted to believe, but forget about all that and let's just evaluate does hormone therapy benefit? Well, and I could even just imagine, right, if you get your whole identity wrapped up in the belief of a thing, exactly. you know, and not, not to pick on, let's say, veganism for a thing, but there's a, a subculture in that world where it's like you're a vegan influencer and you're sort of virtue signaling all how, how vegan and how adherent you are. And it's like, even if they were, might be presented evidence to the contrary of that diet in terms of the long-term health uh, benefits, they, diets, diets their, 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 their identity is attached to it. Yes. So I, that's yes. what I am, yes. right? And so you say that you make that proclamation out loud yes. and you have to almost ignore evidence yes. in order to maintain your yeah. identity attached to it. Diets are the perfect example, yeah. right? Yeah. You're dead set. You know, somebody else makes a suggestion. No, 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 this is true. Why? Because, right. you know, you heard it on Oprah or something. Yeah. And um, Dr. Fessinger, who, who created this idea of cognitive dissonance with his colleagues, he actually did an amazing experiment. He embedded himself in a cult where okay. a, a spaceship was supposed to come and rescue the cult members at a certain day on a certain time. And he heard about this. He read about it in the newspaper and he shows up at the cult <laughs> gathering to like see if his theory was true. Because if his theory was true, if the spaceship didn't show up, then they would just believe even more because they, they wouldn't let go, right? They wouldn't let go of what's already right. in their brain. And that's exactly what happened. The spaceship didn't show up and they became more um, concrete that's in their beliefs. Plan Sight is a complete game changer in the world of insurance brokering. As a broker, you know how time consuming and error prone the traditional RFP process can be. But what if I told you there's a better way? PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP solution on the market made specifically for benefits agencies. It's like having a superpower that gets you an average of eight to 10 hours back per employer renewal per year. And the best part, PlanSight supports all carriers, all funding types, and all group sizes for over 20 different benefits. 
If you're ready to make your RFP process faster, more efficient, and more profitable, it's time to call PlanSight. Visit PlanSight.com now to book a free demo and discover the future of insurance renewals. Yeah. And so that's, you know, we, we do that all the time. We do it with politics. We do it with diets. So yeah, let's talk about diets. the low fat. You low fat. Uh, I lived through that as well, right? The low fat craze. Um, that's a great example. And, you know, maybe now the evidence, obviously, maybe the evidence never supported it, but the modern evidence certainly suggests that maybe it's not a good thing. So t tell me about that and why that was included in the book. Well, one of the greatest perpetrators of misinformation on diet has been the United States government mm -hmm. with the food pyramid mm -hmm. and all that. It originated with a guy named Ansel Keys mm -hmm. in the 60s. And he was kind of the popular guy at the time. He was on the cover of Time Magazine as sort of a medical genius. And he put out there that Eisenhower had his heart attack because he was eating too much saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And he moved the country, convinced the country using some really shoddy data he left out a bunch of countries in his analysis. He could have collected data. He didn't. And he put this theory out there. And then they crushed any person that opposed his low-fat recommendation. Mm -hmm. Famous Dr. Yudkin out of the UK challenged it, said, no, no, it's the, it's the refined carbohydrates that drive general body inflammation. And that enables the coronary artery wall to be inflamed so lipoproteins could embed in there certain kinds. And he was 100% correct. Well, I mean, the, the, the refined carbohydrate theory was 100% correct. And they, he was crushed. And doc after doc was crushed. They did three giant studies to prove that the low-fat diet was better for you. All failed to show that the low-fat mm -hmm. diet reduced heart disease. All of them failed. It didn't deter him from pushing No, it was though, like right? the yeah. cognitive dissonance, right, right? right? It was like what the cult members and, and Festinger's observation. And this thing propagated for 60 years, and it was a bandwagon effect. The American Heart Association was selling their seal to every restaurant mm -hmm. who would buy their license agreement to say, oh, this food was healthy, loaded with sugar, but it's, got, it's low in fat, so it's got the healthy heart seal mm -hmm. from the American Heart Association association, tremendous disinformation, a horrible disservice. And guess what? During the propagation of the low-fat diet, obesity rates mm -hmm. soared. Right. And as they went up, what did they do in the medical establishment? People are not in compliant. We have to comply and get rid of every ounce of fat in the milk in schools, and, <laughs> right. you know, and, you know, get rid of the... Oh, do you, I remember those potato chips where they would strip out the fat and the potato chips. It was like a very brief period of time they'd make them, and they were causing all sorts of gastrointestinal distress, and even had warnings on the bag, like, don't eat more than half a bag because, you know, just some really unfortunate things will happen in your stomach. But, hey, they were low fat. Olestra, and so people, right. Yeah, Olestra, yeah, yeah, Olestra, yeah, 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 that's exactly... Low fat, that was milk, like, you know, drink four glasses of milk a day. Where did they get that yeah. from? Medical dog. Dogma, right? It's, low, it's everywhere. So the, the only thing they did to milk is they took out saturated fat, which is, has no evidence it causes heart disease, and they added sugar, and they put it in school lunches. Mm -hmm. And kids are addicted to it because sugar is addictive. And then the obesity rates are skyrocketing, and they're like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. It's an amazing story. <laughs> I, I discovered the Pima Indians okay. in New Mexico um, had their land destroyed by um, the government. The government felt bad, and so they would deliver free food to the Pima Indians. And of course, because they gave them like spam, they got obese, and diabetes became epidemic in the Indian tribe, mm -hmm. in the Pima Indians. So what did the government do? The NIH scientists swooped in to see if they could identify a gene that yeah, made them- it must be the gene. It right? must be a gene, right? <laughs> Genetic basis. Yeah. And it's like so absurd. Like, no, you're feeding them complete junk and refined carbon. Well, you even brought this up in the price we pay, just the, the food that's de delivered or served in hospitals and settings. And you mentioned Jell-O Jell and things like that. And my goodness, I mean, I've, I've unfortunately been there with family members for certain situations and it's, the, you look at the plate and you're like, you cannot believe this stuff is being served to people that are sick and ill. And I think it's just, you know, I think it's one of the worst examples of bad nutrition. And it's right there in the place that they're supposed to be trying to heal. Um, and it's just, just to me, it's astonishing. Um, I don't know how you feel about that because I know you work inside of a hospital system, but what's your opinion there? I've eaten a lot of hospital okay. food. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I used to get defensive when patients would complain about it. Like, this, this food sucks. I'd be like, hey, watch your mouth. This is what I eat every day. Yeah. This is like my livelihood. But um, 
it's amazing. I mean, some people would consider it a human rights violation when you have all these people starving, a lot of them for no reason. We just, you know, don't eat while you're here. They used to tell pre, pre they used to recommend not feeding premature babies for 48 hours. Can you believe that? No glucose, no uh, uh, oral intake whatsoever. I mean, the dogma looms large. Mm -hmm. um, so the, f the, the food in the hospital is one thing, but what does this bad food do to our microbiome? Right, right. All the antibiotics we give. Yeah, you, you were mentioning to me, and I, I don't know if it was in this book or the previous one, where you talk about sort of the over-prescription of antibiotics, right, and what that's maybe doing to our population at large. So why don't you explain that before we unpack a little bit? What's going on with that over-prescription? Yeah, the microbiome is a big part of this book, Blind Spots, and uh, over 60% of the antibiotics we prescribe as doctors are unnecessary. Now, okay. that's according to a CDC study. I'm not sure the CDC is the best uh, yeah. trusted we source them now, on this but, one or what? Yeah, yeah but this, this is, many studies have supported this. Okay. And so we're taking antibiotics willy-nilly for anything. Telemedicine, people coming in demanding their doctor shaking us down, you know, because some of us need to, you know, they... We may feel like we want to have a good five-star rating from our pay. For whatever reason, consumer demand, the lack of appreciation of the downsides of antibiotics, this myth has floated out there for 60 years that there are no downsides to antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Turns out antibiotics can be TNT on the microbiome, which okay. is the garden of bacteria that normally live in the GI tract. Okay. And so when you have the average three-year-old has already taken a couple courses of antibiotics in America, it has altered the microbiome. And an amazing study was just published that I highlight in Blind Spots where at the Mayo Clinic, they looked at kids who took an antibiotic at birth mm -hmm. or in childhood and kids who did not take an antibiotic in childhood. And they were roughly the same type of child. They were controlled for demographics and other factors. So it was an apples to apples type comparison. And they found that kids that had antibiotics at birth were far more likely to develop chronic diseases, asthma, rhinitis, uh, obesity, um, uh, learning disabilities. Really? This is a Mayo Clinic yeah. study. Yeah. I mean, learning disabilities, all this stuff is on the rise. Mm -hmm. Celiac disease was almost 300% more common in kids who had taken an antibiotic in their childhood mm. versus kids who did not. We're messing with the microbiome, and it's not just antibiotics. Well, have we scaled back, though, that over-prescription of antibiotics, at least, based, or is it still too, <laughs> no, is that too recent of a study to even correct the ship a little bit? Yeah, it just came out. Okay. I talked to the researchers. There's another group in uh, Denmark that's done a similar study. Uh, and is, there, is there a way, if that was the case, to for an individual to sort of restore some of that gut flora so that they can reestablish that system not that naturally? We, okay. Not that we know of with okay. good evidence. Now, okay. people love probiotics, and they mm -hmm. take all kinds of probiotics, but we don't have good data on which type of probiotic to take and what works and what doesn't. So people are trying things, but we, we don't know how to restore mm -hmm. that. People have taken bacterial pills. There's all kinds of studies starting. Antibiotics save lives, I've seen it, but there is a massive abuse. And in children, it is doing tremendous damage. It looks like there is a real association between how we're affecting the microbiome. So when we have all these chronic diseases popping up, including even colon cancer, mm -hmm. which is going up in young people, the colon is lined with the microbiome. And we have studies showing that people who take antibiotics are more likely to have polyps, which are considered precancerous. You look at the rise of uh, colon cancer rates in the US in, in people born after 1950, and it's correlated almost with the year of birth. That's when antibiotics became very popular. Um, you know, for a long time, doctors, we doctors, all we had was like a lancet. We could like, you know, bleed you to death or, you know, <laughs> yeah. try to get rid of the. Then antibiotics came along in 1922. And in the post-World War II era, they were mass produced. And for the first time, we wore white coats. It was the white coat era. We had the authority to prescribe a magical pill that could cure disease. And we did a lot of good. But the, in, the discoverer of penicillin, um, uh, Alexander Fleming, he had said after he got the Nobel Prize, Watch out for overuse. Mm -hmm. Now we've got resistant bacteria, 
that are killing tens of thousands of people. That is the next pandemic. It's just slow in its entry. And we've got this problem of altering the microbiome, yeah. not to mention C-sections and other things that alter the microbiome. Yeah, and I think it's it comes down to a question of sort of appropriateness. I think that was something you touched on in the price we pay. It seems like it's a recurring theme here is, mm -hmm. is, is there an appropriateness to for application, right? Whether it be a surgery, whether it's indicated or an antibiotic that's mm -hmm. overprescribed. You know, what gets us into these positions of sort of a dogmatic thinking and group think where it just becomes the norm without any thought of, is it or should it be the norm? Like, and how do we pull ourselves out of what looks like very massive and very entrenched group think over a very long period of time? Let's fix it. How do we do that? Yeah, so this is one of the giant blind spots of modern medicine is the appropriateness of mm -hmm. care. Now, um, we have all these quality measures, but really they're triggered after we do something. Like we do an operation, then we're measuring the complication rate or the infection rate. Well, a lot of stuff has like almost no complications. Knee arthroscopy, colonoscopy, mammograms, really, we have no measurable complications that are different from center to center, diff any different from the noise and the data. We're not talking about the appropriateness of care. Did you need that operation? Mm -hmm. Did you need the CAT scan? Did you need that prescription for uh, an opioid or whatever it was? That's been a giant blind spot. Now, we did a study at Johns Hopkins on our research team asking doctors nationwide, what percent of medical care, in your opinion, is unnecessary? They said 21%. Mm -hmm. Now, in any industry, I think healthcare is 4.5 trillion now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if that's over a trillion dollars <laughs> of unnecessary care. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. When I look at on the payer side, or I look at on like how do we sustain the system in and of itself? Well, the average uh, family premium in the United States is somewhere around $24,000 annually. That in, in, employers and employees have to bear the burden of this. Taxpayers in one form or another have to bear the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. It's got to be funded somehow. But if we keep putting so much price pressure and volume pressure on it, where do we get, how do we keep ourselves from getting to the precipice of sort of collapse of the system in general? And I think appropriateness yeah. plays into that to a degree, right? Yeah, so we're creating through a consortium called Global Appropriateness Measures, or GAM, we've created a way now to measure the appropriateness of care at the provider level. You should be able to look up the C-section rate of a doctor in low-risk deliveries, in that doctor's low-risk population. Um, and if you design the measure properly, you can see which doctors are doing things way too inappropriately, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which um, doctors are using pig placenta for their diabetic wound care because it's a $2,000 wound dressing change they can do every week. We can see all these patterns in big data. So we're using that now with employer groups. The C-section thing is important because too many women are told C-section might be a little safer for the baby. Mm -hmm. Well, if you misrepresent the truth and, and say suggest that to women, 100% of women are going to say, just do the C-section. Right, right. So um, it's a nudge. It's a well-known thing. You look at the C-section rates by individual, and you see some of those at 50, 60, 70% of low-risk deliveries are doing C-sections. These are data that can be used for quality improvement, for navigation. The fundamental problem we have in healthcare is we have an incompetent marketplace. And the way to fix that is not to create rules around bad behavior, but to shed light and make that a competent marketplace where the competition is on price and quality. Mm -hmm not billboards and valet parking and NFL ads, right. but on real things that are really important. And the C-section thing is important because when you're born by C-section, now I gotta say, C-sections save lives and sometimes they're absolutely necessary. It's very important, mm -hmm. people know that. Yes. But when you're born by C-section, the baby is extracted from a sterile operative field. The gut uh, is sterile at birth, and is seeded with bacteria that live in the hospital and other bacteria. When you're born uh, th vaginally, the, the microbiome of the baby is seeded from the bacteria that normally live in the birth canal. And then it's supplemented with kisses and breastfeeding and other bacteria, bacteria from other sources. So we're, you're, you're, the baby's microbiome is starting off with an entirely different foundation when the baby is mm. born by C-section. These are things that people don't appreciate when they're just told, hey, how would you like to deliver? 
you know, oh, I think I'll do a C-section. I'll, you know, schedule it on the day of grandmother's birthday or. Right. <laughs> no, there are real health consequences yeah. to C-sections. Higher rates of asthma, higher rates of inflammatory bowel disease in kids born by C-section compared to kids who are not. Why? We're changing the microbiome in ways we have not fully appreciated. ClaimDoc is a medical claim auditing and member advocacy company. We provide fiduciary services to employer-sponsored benefit plans, and allowing them to create an environment where we ensure that the benefit plans are being charged in a fair and reasonable basis. My business is basically people, and it become a real simple transition. We thought it was gonna be far more complex. I've saved, we'll say, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I could not say enough about ClaimDoc. Absolutely, and I, I look at you. Know, one of the things that you, I think, that was born out of again the price we pay is that the way that you were able to identify these outliers. Um, but you didn't really shame them. It didn't seem like you you pointed the fingers at them and That's blamed right. it. it. Was like showing them where they fall on the spectrum with their peers and letting them sort of self discover that I am an outlier and well, I don't want to be an outlier. It's almost like they were fearful of now being able to be identified as maybe somebody who was overdoing something, and so they naturally decided on their own to course correct to be within the guardrails of the parameters of appropriateness. I think that was a very delicate and artful way that you expose them and shine a light on it, but did make them feel guilty or shame them in order to get them to change their behavior. Yeah, we're, I mean, look, we're doctors, we're competitive by nature. It's mm -hmm. part of the medical school culture. You know, everybody was ranked in my med school and every test you get re-ranked and it was, it's just a very competitive individualistic mindset, especially in my field of surgery. You know, the surgeon's the captain of the ship and, and there are benefits to that approach, but we don't have enough teamwork. We don't focus enough on the non-technical skills that a doctor needs. Communication, uh, building a team, explaining things to a patient. Instead, we focus on the technical skills when we do physician training. And it turns out that because we're wired the way we are, nobody likes to be an outlier. And you're right, doctors who are outliers, when we showed them their own data mm -hmm. in a civilized fashion where there's no shaming, we're just showing them where they stand, they auto-correct their behavior. We've mm -hmm. published that result. And that's well, that's, and I'm a big fan of the, the term, the sunlight is the, the best disinfectant. And yeah. I think even when I'm looking at our system inside, all the fraud, waste and abuse over the exploitative practices sometimes that arise, there's bad incentives that cause certain behaviors, you know, and I'll, I'll do this. Um, I think you, you talked about some procedure that they would separate into two days when it should have been done in one day. Yeah. And it was, so you could bill twice and put under anesthesia twice. And, yeah. you know, all that really comes down to is it sounds like it's simply a way to charge more money yeah. and extract more money, un uh, unfortunately, out of the system. Yeah. But as we sort of move on, and I want to move towards the end, and I know you guys got dinner and you guys got other mm -hmm. things as well. I want to be conscientious of your time. What are you thinking about? Because I know when you write a book, you don't stop thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You don't go, okay, well, now all of a sudden I've, I've put everything I need to know out there for the world and I'm good. So what are some of the things here in, in 2024 that you're sort of focused on and maybe even thinking about perhaps for a next book? Well, the employer-sponsored healthcare space, your space, is one of the most interesting and exciting areas in healthcare right now because the, the folks who are really designing healthcare um, or de facto have the levers in healthcare are folks that are designing benefits for employer groups. That's most Americans get mm -hmm. their benefits that mm -hmm. way. And it's the hospitals and they need to do it, do a better job. Look, the book is not anti hospitals or anti doctor. No, I'm not anti hospital I, myself either. No. Yeah. Look, we all need to be paid fairly and appropriately, but we need transparency and we need people who are honestly presenting options. And the problem right now is that we've got a blame game. Everyone's blaming mm -hmm. something else. Sure. We all can do better. We doctors can do better. Yeah. Uh, insurance companies can do better. Employers can make better decisions. It burns me up to watch employers get ripped off on their healthcare benefits. Mm -hmm. They can do so much more. They can, they can make better choices. PBMs are um, a very mixed bag. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple big ones. There's and I won't, I won't name them, but there's <laughs> we one. We know there. <laughs> <laughs> there's one that um, begins with a C um, and ends with an S, and they're putting out a business, an independent pharmacy in my neighborhood. They're squeezing them mm -hmm. on what they pay them. They're um, withholding payments, and then they're offering to buy them every month 
They'll aggressively offer. They're putting them out of business in a way that's un-American. It's anti-small business, anti-family. It's a family-owned pharmacy. And we're feeding this system by uh, just blindly giving our business with these terrible PBM contracts to these giant PBM companies. Mm -hmm. Why don't we say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't right. They're not acting as an honest fiduciary here. Mm -hmm. They're putting out of business using anti-competitive practices, my community pharmacy. And so, um, and they're ripping employers off, you know, it's some order. Well, you mentioned the fiduciary. Do you think that enhance, enhanced fiduciary standards that are coming with the CAA might help us uh, it, by putting the onus on the employer to sort of showcase and prove that they are, um, one, fall in the regulations, but two, they're actually being good stewards of the finances and are picking vendors that are doing appropriate things. Do you think that might bump us a little bit in the right direction as a result? I hope so. Okay. I hope so. The, the problem is the the business of health benefits your business yes is bought based on scare tactics sometimes mm -hmm. and somebody plants some piece of fear like oh if you leave uh, CVS you're going to have some cancer patient you know die because they can't get chemotherapy and those <laughs> those stories drive purchasing decisions and when you make changes there's work uh, work for HR work for the benefits advisor and so the um, work averse mentality, which I get it, they're, everyone's busy. I mean, HR people are getting swamped with yeah. millions of different requests and regulatory requirements. And, you know, they, they didn't go to school to be experts in J codes and PBM contracts and, you know, uh, you know legal lingo and co-pays. Th these are things they've had to learn on the job. And um, I don't think it's really fair that, uh, uh, you know, fair to the HR people that they're being tasked with these very complicated issues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with specialty pharmacies and other things. So, you know, we don't have bad people mm -hmm. in the system. We have good people with this bad system we inherited. Right. And I just don't think it's fair to be putting these massive decisions uh, on the desk of HR sometimes when they're overloaded. They well, I, would agree, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And I think the one thing that I hope I can contribute to the whole uh, narrative is just simply discussing these things, like just bringing awareness to some of the problems, uh, bringing forth solutions mm. to those problems. Um, I'm with you. I inherited, I walked into a system <laughs> that existed before me. And, you know, I don't know if and even in my lifetime you could say is quote unquote fixed. Uh, but I do think it's good to sort of like bring these things to the, the surface and Mark Cuban's doing a pretty good job mm -hmm. with cost plus of bringing attention to this we've got the what is it the power to the patient movement that's, yeah. that's yeah. bringing awareness to some of these bad practices and hospital billing and things like that and so i think it's a needs to be more part of a public discourse and my hope is that some of the terminology around self-funding and stuff that we've talked about today um, becomes common knowledge mm -hmm. becomes mm -hmm. normal so it doesn't seem so burdensome for an hr person or a cfo or a coo to be able to institute within a small business that's one of the things that pareto that we try to do is simplify that process for everybody um, but you know outside of these things we just discussed is there anything that we didn't really cover because again i don't want to i could keep here for three hours <laughs> I, I, I honestly could it's fun I know that's not on the table, but you know anything anything burning for you that you really just want to get out there before we before we jump. If we got so many major health recommendations wrong in the modern era in the last twenty years, the low fat diet, opioids, uh, and saying antibiotics won't hurt you, hormone replacement therapy, peanut allergies, you go down the list. Mm -hmm. There's a long list, by the way, it's, and it's the major. It's some of the biggest recommendations we have made as a medical profession. We've gotten wrong. Mm -hmm. If we've gotten all these things wrong because we made recommendations based on opinion and not good evidence, what are we doing right now that we may have wrong? What are the things where the studies need to be done, we have to interrogate the current practices, and we have to be open-minded to whatever the data shows. Mm -hmm. So in the book, Blind Spots, I, I leave with 10 things that we're doing now, now that we need to you know, question, we need proper research. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope it gets people thinking because I think, unfortunately, we live in an era now where people immediately want to polarize, wait a minute, are you on my team or, or their team right. or which side are you on? You know what, we should all be on everyone's side. 
And the reason I love um, people in the benefit space that are innovating and pushing the field, that's what I'm trying to do in medicine is push the field, mm -hmm. try to increase accountability around hospital price gouging and predatory billing and their tax exempt status. Are they living up to the charity benefit? That's our job in medicine. We got to push the field. In the field of benefits, people are pushing the field and it's good, right? These are the questions we need to be having. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's very healthy because we can deliver gold-plated healthcare to everyone in America. We can figure out how to pay and finance for healthcare. But if we're still recommending bad medical practice, if we're still issuing bad health recommendations, then we're gonna continue to struggle. Yeah. So I like people who ask questions and that's what the innovative um, uh, sector within the health benefits community is doing. I think, I mean, curiosity is one of those things that you have to be continuously curious and ask questions, right? And I don't think you ever, I think the, what I've discovered over the course of my career is the more I think I know, the more I acknowledge that I don't mm -hmm. know anything. Um, you know and I think that's is. maybe, yeah, a good place to be. But I'm, I'm excited that guys like you and you mentioned Huberman earlier and uh, Dr. T as well. I'm excited that there's a, a sort of a popularity and influence level that you all are having these days in sort of the common lexicon uh, uh, of, you know, of public discourse. And it's really neat to see that happening. And I just hope it happens more and more. Maybe we'll have some benefits brokers that are also going to be very popular public figures, because I think we all collectively need to work together to figure this thing out. And a lot of it starts with just growing the awareness of the problem itself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dr. Marty McCary, I'll call you Marty. I know you told Marty. me to. Yeah. Marty, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure, man. I really appreciate you making this a part of uh, your stop. Can't wait to dig in further to this book. I'm sure it's going to be another one of those uh, New York Times bestsellers, if I have my suspicion. But again, thanks for chatting with me, and it's really nice to get to know you, sir. Great to see you, Spence. My thanks. pleasure. Bye.